We are delighted to have all of you here with us this evening for this great community forum when friends and neighbors can get together and consider issues important to us and to our community. I'm Les Zeitz. I'm the editor of the Salem Reporter, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Let's get to work. We're here to learn about a ballot measure you're going to be voting on starting next week, about whether the city of Salem should impose a new tax to pay for services and take care of our community. The ballots will go out October 18th by mail. Election day will be November 7th. We're going to have presentations by two of our panelists. I want to assure you this is not a debate this is your occasion to hear directly information important to you to make your decision on your vote. As you listen to these presentations, you likely will have questions. You saw as you came in cards and pencils for you to prepare questions in writing. I invite you to, if you didn't get a card or have questions you want to pose as the program evolves, we have some fine students from McNary's theater program here who will be our runners. They can get you a card and they will pick up your questions when you hold them up through the program. This also is being broadcast live this evening so more of our neighbors and residents of Salem can participate remotely. And we're grateful for Capital Community Media for taking part and being our broadcast partner. One final little housekeeping detail, of course, Please mute your cell phones. We want all the attention up here on the stage, not on you being embarrassed, taking a call from Aunt Millie. So we're joined on the stage tonight by two journalists from Salem Reporter. To my far left is Rachel Alexander, managing editor of the Salem Reporter. And next to her is Abby McDonald. Abby has been reporting relentlessly on this issue in the recent weeks, and many of you have seen her coverage on Salem Reporter. We're going to start this evening by having Abby present to you some basic information about city government and city funding. I want to note that we did ask and invite Salem city officials to participate in that, and they declined to do so for various reasons. So with that, <coughs> Abby? What's this all about? All right. Well, thank you to everybody for being here. I did not think uh, this is where 30 articles would end up with me on a stage, but I kind of like it. Uh, so my name is Abby McDonald. Um, I'm the community reporter over at Salem Reporter, and I've been in Salem for about a year, and I've been writing about payroll tax for half that time. I've even dreamed about the payroll tax at this point. Um, so I'm here to give, as uh, Les said, a rundown of some of the things I've learned in the past six months and more of a just straightforward budget talk before we get into uh, perspectives on this position. Um, but let's start with some historical fun facts because I know that's why we all came here. Uh, so I reached out to two of our local historians and asked them to find the oldest budget that they could. And within, I think, two hours, they got me one from 1869. Uh, it had a lot of really fun stuff in there. Uh, the whole thing was fit in this much of the statesman's uh, newspaper, and it was less than 20 lines, and under $10,000 for the whole thing. A third of that was for the fire department. Uh, the city attorney was paid $100, and they spent $500 on three parties. Um, and what, I, what was striking to me when I was looking at that budget is it's, it's really easy when you look 100 years in the past to think about how much city roles change and how much budgets change. And we're kind of in one of those moments right now that it's, I think in 100 years people are going to be thinking about the decisions that Salem is making in November. So that's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> how did we get here? Um, the city points to measures in the 1990s that Oregon voters voted on uh, where they capped the level of property tax revenue uh, that could be taken from property owners throughout the state. Uh, when this happened, uh, the city slowed its expansion. Uh, for instance, if it would have kept hiring at the same rate it did in the 1990s, it would have 300 more staff now than it does. 
Um, even though it's slowed its expansion, it has uh, branched out into different roles that it hasn't taken on before. Uh, that includes using federal COVID money to get involved in homeless services. You may have heard of the newly built Navigation Center. Um, also in recent years, the city population has expanded by a lot. Uh, there's now over 180,000 people living in Salem. That's up 26,000 from 2008. Uh, in that time, Salem uh, as a city collects 37 million more in property taxes than it did in 2008, but it's also seeing increased expenses. Its general fund expenses have increased by 83 million within that time period while maintaining around the same level of staff. So all funding combined, the city's expecting an $11 million gap in the next year that will expand to 64 million in the next year, meaning it has 64 million in spending that it won't be able to uh, do. <laughs> the um, average Salem, um, a Salem household that is worth $200,000 will pay around $1,100 a month toward the city in services. These services include, a year, um, my note cards run, $1,100,000 a year. Um, those services include everything from uh, the library, city roads, police, and fire make up over half of it. Um, and the city council might al also improve projects including $2 million in airport terminal renovations to welcome Avello as it did uh, last week. Uh, something worth noting is it can't use the infrastructure bond funding that voters passed in November to address issues like uh, we're seeing tonight. Uh, the payroll tax will be for salaries and the infrastructure bond is only for capital improvement projects. Uh, so how did the city come to a payroll tax? Uh, as I mentioned, this uh, property tax cap was uh, statewide and other cities have been facing the same challenges. Eugene opted for a payroll tax that looks different than Salem's. And uh, Portland offered, uh, opt Portland started charging people making over um, $125,000 to fund some of his homeless services. Uh, in 2018, Salem put together a revenue tax force uh, and it offered a couple options to address these revenue challenges. One of those was the operations fee, which you've started seeing on your utility bills starting in 2020, and that was increased uh, earlier this year. And uh, the other option that it recommended was the payroll tax. Uh, it, the committee said that the payroll tax would be difficult to implement and would require a lot of communication with the community, but they saw it as one of the more feasible options as it wouldn't require um, state intervention or uh, a lengthy approval process, things like that. Um, the payroll tax was headed for the 2020 ballot, but it was pulled due, the pan due to the pandemic, and the Citizen Budget Committee picked it up earlier this year as part of its budget discussions. Uh, I s caught up with some of the nine citizen members on the Budget Committee, and they ultimately approved the payroll tax and recommended uh, putting it forward without voter, voter approval. They said that in, at the end, they wanted to see it look a little different, they wanted to see it more equitable, but they thought it was the most feasible option for Salem at this time. So what is the tax that you're gonna be deciding on? Um, the council approved a less than 1% tax uh, that does not apply to people who make uh, below minimum wage or at minimum wage. It'll cost the average Salem worker who makes $26 around $42 a month, and it impacts anyone who works in Salem whether or not uh, you live there. And it also, uh, if you work hybrid, you'll be charged for the hours that you work within the city. Uh, a, the city council recommended, or they approved putting it forward uh, without taking it to voters first, but a petition has brought it to your ballot boxes. Um, the city projects that it could bring $28 million in revenue per year to fund and sustain and expand its police, fire, and homeless services throughout the city. And tonight you're going to be hearing from both sides on this topic about uh, what is next for the future of our city and why your vote matters. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, and I assume your next stop is the job in broadcast journalism now. All right, let's, let's turn to the people that you came here to hear tonight. We have with us tonight, to my immediate right, Virginia Stapleton, who's the Salem City Council President, and she's here representing the organization Save Salem. And next to her is Preston Mann of Oregon Business and Industry, a business group based here in Salem. And he's here tonight on behalf of Defeat the Tax on Salem Workers. So, Virginia, you're on. 15 minutes. Go. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out for this really important event um, in our community. Thank you for um, the Salem Reporter for hosting.
hosting us and the staff at the Elsinore. This is a fantastic event. I know we were both thr uh, just thrilled to be up here. Um, I wanted to say that I do not have this event on my life's bingo card. This is not something I was ever planning on doing. Um, but I am thrilled to be here and have a captive audience for 15 minutes to hear all the riveting things about the Salem City budget. So you're trapped now, and uh, I hopefully have your full attention. Um, so I want to cover a couple of things tonight. I want to introduce to you the Committee to Save Salem and explain what we're all about. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we got here and what's happening around the state, as well as what's at risk here in the city of Salem. And I'm going to end with some next steps that I'm hoping I can get your help with. So who we are. Oh, sure. So who we are, the Committee to Save Salem is a small, local, grassroots effort aimed at elevating the conversation around the city's budget. It's an education campaign, and we are in favor of a yes vote for this November 7th, which would provide the city with new revenue that would get much needed revenue for our uh, emergency services like police, fire, and EMS, as well as continuing our unhoused programs. There are four members of this committee. Uh, Paul Teigen has been a member of our budget committee for six years. Uh, Dr. Brown has been on, is on the budget committee and is serving as vice chair. Michael Slater is a planning commissioner for the city of Salem, and I am Virginia Stapleton. I am your Ward 1 city councilor and current uh, council president. So how did we get here? A lot of people who I talk to about this issue are really surprised to learn about the struggles that we are facing with the general fund. And I was one of those people too. I actually learned about this in 2018 when I attended a neighborhood association meeting. And I uh, heard the then Ward 1 counselor, Kara Kayser, talking about the payroll tax. So since then, I've become a city councilor. I've had the privilege and uh, real honor to serve my community by going through trainings to educate me on the city's budget, uh, by going through the process three times now, and also getting to know my counterparts across the state and learn about what city councilors um, in all of these different towns are facing uh, because of measures five and 50. So you're gonna hear a lot about measures five and 50 tonight because I wanna talk about each one of them. So these uh, were measures that were passed that were really aimed at limiting the growth of government. And they have had a lasting negative impact on cities' budgets across the state. So before 1990, uh, local governments in Oregon would levy the amount of property taxes needed to fund their expenses. That was the full sentence I got on what it looks like before measures five and 50, which is pretty shocking. Um, so as you could well imagine, in 1990, we passed measure five, and it limits the tax that local governments, uh, like the city of Salem, can levy on any property. So it's $10 per 100,000 of assessed value. So this measure would later create an issue called compression, and I'm gonna talk about that super riveting and exciting conversation a little bit later, but I promise to get to it. So Measure 50 did three different things. It created a permanent tax rate, it capped the growth, and it um, had a depreciating um, aspect on new properties that are coming on to the tax rolls. So. The first thing it did was the property or the permanent rate. These rates have been frozen in time ever since the 1997 measure that was passed. The city of Salem's tax rate is set at 5.8315 per 1,000, and other cities have different permanent rates. Um, we have a city, um, Hepner in Morale County, and that is set at 10.62 per 1,000. And the city of Eugene, one of the comparables to uh, the city of Salem is set at 7.01 per 1,000. So I asked, well, how did these cities get the rate that they have? And the answer was very simple. When this measure passed, they took the rate that they were currently charging, they brought it down by 10%, and they froze it in time. 
So that is how each of the cities across Oregon got their rate. And for some, it is less. For some, it's more. I think the city of Kaiser is just over $2 per 1,000. So really, we were lucky to be kind of right in the middle. Um, but it has caused a lot of problems. So the measure also limits the growth of property assessed um, to a value of 3% annually. Um, and that is something when you look at um, expenses that are maybe at 5% or 6% or even um, as high as 10%, when you look at that 3% increase in revenue, you can see where that structural imbalance is going to occur. This measure also limited um, how much a new property can come on the tax rolls through what is called the change property ratio or CPR, which I just found um, really hilarious. So CPR is calculated every year by the county and it is a ratio of assessed value, the average assessed value and the average real market value. So Marion County, our most recent um, rating is 0.5114. So in real math, real numbers for us, a new property that comes on the tax rolls, um, excuse me, a new property that is built at $450,000 in real market value comes on the tax rolls at only $230,000. So you can tell that that is about half of the value that we are seeing. So what's interesting is that example that I got um, is one that I experienced. That's my house. That is what my husband and I have. We have a home that is uh, it has a real market value much higher than the assessed value. And for our home alone, the city is missing out on $1,300 a year in taxes from us because of this situation. So let's talk about compression, my very favorite topic. <laughs> Measure five limited the total amount that we can charge against a property $10 for every 1,000 assessed. So if you have taxes that exceed that $10 limit, then you are going to go uh, into overage or what we call compression. It's proportioned out across all the government agencies and the tax returns for those local governments are reduced by that amount that's over. So in the city of Salem, we have two different counties that we're dealing with. If you are a property owner or a homeowner in Polk County, you're looking pretty good because your total government services right now are $9.5407 in your uh, government services. So you are not experiencing any compression, but Marion County is a different story. Right now, we are at 10.3999, and that is resulting in some properties that are experiencing compression. So since the $10 limit that we have, that extra, the .399, gets reduced proportionately across the taxing jurisdictions in that government category. So if the city wanted to add a voter approved levy to pay for any of the general fund services that we're talking about tonight, things like police, fire parks, or a library bond, or excuse me, levy, then that would come already on top of a compressed situation in Marion County. So properties that were currently experiencing compression would not pay for the levy. So one last thing, while we're all now masters of compression. <laughs> Property tax exemptions. The city of Salem, and you all have acknowledged this as well, is in a unique situation, being that it's the capital. We have 8% of the area of the city limits here is considered state property. And it has a shocking $1.65 billion in real market value. The state-owned properties, were on, if they were on the tax rolls, we would be bringing in an extra $7.25 million annually. That does not include things like churches, schools, county buildings, state hospital, or excuse me, the hospital or other nonprofits. So when you start to add all of that, you can kind of start to get the picture of what we're up against here being in the capital city. So to sum it up, the cost of running a city is outpacing our revenue from property taxes. We have slowly been cutting services for over 20 years. And we have had to get creative on ways to increase revenue options, like our operations fee but we can no longer uh, continue to make cuts. So after we hit pause with COVID and we used our federal one-time dollars to backfill, we are now out of money and we are needing to raise revenue. So I wanted to bring this up a level and talk about what's happening um, across the state. Because I think it's really important for you all to know that you're not alone. 
So we just received a Peer City report that looked at Eugene, Gresham, Hillsboro, Bend, Springfield, and Corvallis. All of these cities are report reporting a current and projected deficit from anywhere between three to $15 million by 2026. Additional revenue options and cuts are being considered in each of these cities. Even Eugene, who has a payroll tax, is looking at a deficit of $8 million by 2025. Many are looking at local option levies, which as we just learned with compression is not always a great option. And of course, others are looking at operations fees. So to give you some real dollars here, Eugene's looking at cutting 1.5 million from their public works department, 3.7 million from police, and 6.6 .6 million from libraries. Gresham has a deficit of 8.2 million in fiscal year 24. Their public safety levy measure failed, and now they are using their fund balance or their savings account, and the leftover ARPA dollars, which were the federal one-time dollars, to fill the hole. They have a growing deficit projected to be 15.2 million by fiscal year 26. Over the last two years, they have cut 31 positions with more to come. Hillsboro has been having expenditures have exceeded their revenues since fiscal year 21. And in Bend, they are selling off $9.2 million of city owned land to cover their deficit. They have also made the hard decision to no longer support their sheltering options. So what happens here in Salem? If the payroll tax fails in November, city council will need to um, approve a supplemental budget that will take care of the next six months, so January through June of this next year. The proposed plan from the city looks at closing the West Salem Library and reducing hours and days at the main library, cutting seven positions with the fire department, five from the police department, and 13 positions across support services, things like HR and IT and legal. We will also have to increase the fees we charge for services at the Center 50 Plus and our parks programs. In the coming months, we will need to cut seven positions from our parks maintenance crews, which is a quarter of our crews that we have now. We will have more cuts to library staff, youth services, and our sheltering programs. I want to pause here and highlight our sheltering programs right now. We are having a lot of success with our micro shelter and navigation center. We have funding for the micro shelters through June of 2024, and for the Navigation Center, we have funding through June of 2025. At that point in time, we will need to cut those services if we do not find new revenue, and over 200 folks will find themselves back out on the streets. This will have a negative cascading effect for everybody in the city. We'll increase the city's cost in the end because it always costs more money to contest with unmanaged camping than it is to help support the programs that we have in place now. Although it's frustrating for some to spend money in this way, I think it's important for all of us to remember what our downtown looked like just a few years ago. We will pay either way on this issue. And I would rather spend the money to, on proven programs that work to end homelessness. The cuts will continue until we find new revenue options. June 2025, we will see reductions of 12 police positions and the option of closing two fire stations, which is the equivalent of 18 full-time employees. So if the payroll tax passes, we will then start what's called a rulemaking process, and that is where residents, business owners, and others will come together with city staff to work out how this is gonna be implemented. We know there are a lot of questions. How is it gonna work for people who work from home? How does it work for the delivery folks who are in and out of city, uh, city limits? Those questions will be addressed in an open and transparent process. As I mentioned above, we have to find a new form of revenue to sustain critical city services. If it is not the payroll tax, it will be something else. The payroll tax was the best option presented to us at the time. It grows as the city grows and it helps to stabilize the general fund. We understand that nobody wants to hear this. We understand that people are hurting, that we are still all recovering from COVID. 
We are looking at worldwide effects like war that change the cost of living for us in our everyday lives. And we understand that it's so challenging now that your city council is coming to you and asking for an increase in taxes. If we could do it any other way, we would. We tried so hard to mitigate the pain as much as we could by exempting minimum wage workers and by protecting retirees who are often on fixed incomes. To be clear, if this measure fails, there will be cuts and they will negatively impact many of us, but especially people on the lower income spectrum who utilize city services more than others. So this is what I need from you. I need you to stay engaged. This is an amazing effort right here by all of you. Thank you so much for taking time to be here. I need you to learn more about why we find ourselves in this situation and what makes the tax system in Oregon so unique. And I need you to join cities across Oregon for, and demand that our state legislators take on measures 5 and 50 and find a way to reform our broken tax system. The city of Salem is growing and thriving. The business community is growing. We are building more and more homes across the city. And like it was mentioned, we just had a voter approved bond of over $300 million with investments to our parks, our libraries, and our fire department. That was historic. Salem is a wonderful town and it has amazing potential. The one glaring issue is the city's general fund. The payroll tax will stabilize that general fund and provide the city the ability to keep investing in our community and meeting the needs of our residents. I hope you can join me in voting yes on November 7th and continue to invest in this wonderful city. Thank you so much. Thank you, Virginia. And to show you that I'm no budget expert, uh, Preston, you get 17 minutes. <laughs> I hopefully won't use all of that. Here. Go ahead. Your, your, your 17 minutes is on, Preston. Let's do it. Well, thank you, Les, and thank you to the Salem Reporter for, for putting this on. You've got a great team there at the Salem Reporter. I think I actually learned the petition qualified from Abby when she called me, so that's a testament to how dogged your team has been on this issue. Uh, my name is Preston Mann. I'm the Director of Political Affairs for Oregon Business and Industry. Uh, I'm also the Chief Petitioner on the referendum to put this issue on the ballot. Uh, but I think just as importantly in this conversation, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm somebody who's lived in this community for over 20 years now. I graduated from high school here, uh, and I care deeply about the future of this community, just like all of you do. It's really fantastic to see so many people out here this evening. Um, I think we're both really excited to see so many faces engaged in this conversation. This is an incredibly important conversation for this community. Uh, I also want to back up for just a second and uh, go back in time to the petition phase of this campaign. That was an incredible effort by this community. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked on a number of initiatives and ballot measures throughout my career. I have never seen anything like what this community accomplished in such a short amount of time. In less than 25 days, we were able to gather nearly 13,000 signatures to put this issue before voters so all of you could decide this November. That's an incredible testament to this community. Uh, it illustrates just how much all of you want to have a say before you have to pay this ta tax. So if you're in the room tonight uh, and you were a part of that effort, I thank you, I salute you for being a part of that. Just an incredible community effort, so thank you. But now it's time to turn our attention to uh, the tax itself. Um, I will certainly be advocating for a no vote. It's no surprise to any of you. Oregon Business and Industry, the association that I work for, will also be advocating for a no vote. And here's why. As an organization that's generally focused on state legislative policy, we see dozens and dozens of tax measures come through the legislature every year. I've seen taxes on coffee, taxes on used cars, you name it. Uh, some of those have made it through the finish line and we all pay them today. I don't know that I've ever seen a tax as complicated and convoluted as this one. Certainly payroll taxes are not a new phenomenon in local governments. We have statewide payroll taxes, uh, but this particular pa tax is different. It applies to wages earned within the city limits. That's, that's really troubling 
because how are you supposed to know when you're in the city limits? It's not like you cross a red line every time you enter the city limits or exit the city limits. When city staff have trouble explaining to folks how exactly this tax is going to work or if a pizza delivery driver who originates within the city limits and then exits the city limits, you know, at what point they're supposed to start tracking when they're paying the tax or when they're not paying the tax. When a realtor from outside of this community comes into this community and, say, spends eight hours doing an open house, are they paying a tax on that? I mean, the way the ordinance is written, yes. And you heard Councillor Stapleton say, well, we'll figure it out in rulemaking. And to be fair, that's a common answer that you'll get in government. But in this particular case, in it, with a tax as unique as this one, what that really means is you have to pass it to figure out how it's going to work. That doesn't sit well with me. That doesn't sit well with a lot of the employers that I've talked to in this community. And that doesn't sit well with many of the 13,000 people that signed the petition that are going to have to potentially pay this tax. Now, you might be asking yourself why an association like Oregon Business and Industry uh, decided to get involved in a local issue. It's not something we wouldn't normally do. Many of you probably have never heard of Oregon Business and Industry. Uh, like I said, we're a statewide association focused on what goes on down the street in the other building. Uh, but we are so concerned about the structure of this tax, the complicated nature of it, that we decided that we could not see this particular tax be replicated in communities across the state. It creates an administrative nightmare. It creates confusion. Uh, we don't want to see a war between communities over taxing each other's citizens. Um, we felt so strongly about the negative impacts of this tax that we decided to try and put this measure on the ballot. And thanks to the help of many of you, that's exactly what we did. This is a delicate conversation, and I want to emphasize that despite our opposition to this tax, OBI is not an organization that is anti-revenue. I think many of the 13,000 people that signed the petition are not anti-revenue. We all want to see city services funded at a level that keeps us safe, that keeps up our quality of life, and that continues to move this city in the right direction. The City Council has raised an incredibly legitimate concern with the amount of state property that is owned right downtown, all over this community, that really the city sees no revenue for. You have state employees traveling from all over the state into this community every day. They are accessing our services. When there's a medical emergency in our state building, it's the city that responds. It's the taxpayers of Salem that pay the bill. That is a very legitimate concern. It's a concern that has been acknowledged by our state legislators. It's a concern that's been looked at by our city's most prominent resident, Governor Tina Kotek, who has acknowledged that this is a legitimate concern that needs to be addressed moving forward. But I would note that Governor Kotek has also said she's likely to vote no on this tax for many of the reasons I've already mentioned here tonight. But before I go any further, what this tax is really about for me at the end of the day is the people who are going to pay it, many of you. Uh, you're all Salem workers or have been Salem workers in some capacity, and you've heard the figures. For the average Salem worker, this tax is going to cost you over $500 a year. For families with two working adults, that's over $1,000 a year. Folks, gas prices are high. Housing prices are nev have never been higher. It's tough out there. And as much as I acknowledge that the city budget might be in crisis, family budgets are in crisis too. And I think we can't forget that in this conversation. People are having a very difficult time paying the bills right now. And $500 to $1,000 per family, that's a lot of money. And I, frankly, I don't think people can afford that. I've heard from many people who are concerned about their ability to afford it. Uh, there was a woman who testified at the city council meeting. I believe her name was Jolene. And with tears in her eyes, she said, I don't, I don't even live in Salem, but I work in Salem. This tax is going to force me to make some very difficult choices, and but for keeping my health care, I probably wouldn't choose to work anymore. That's the kind of decisions that folks in this community are going to have to make if this tax moves forward. I think there's a better way. I think just as concerning, though, there's been some uh, allusions to the, the Eugene payroll tax. Eugene does have a payroll tax. Um, that tax is structured very differently. Uh, one of the key ways it's structured differently is that tax has a cap. Uh, the city council recognized that in order to pass a tax on wages such as this one, they needed buy-in from the community. So they put a cap on it, and they put it to voters, and guess what? Voters signed off on it. This tax has no cap. 
And the city council has said, this is just the start. They need more revenue. You just heard it tonight. I acknowledge that the city has very real financial challenges. But if you're okay paying $500, wait till this tax gets to $1,000 or $1,500. There has to be a broader conversation. It cannot be just this tax or we're cutting everything. And finally, I want to acknowledge that community safety really does matter. I think we've all been touched by community safety uh, in different ways. For me, I've got two younger siblings that were adopted into my family. Um, they were both born on the street in this community. Uh, my youngest sister, her mother still lives on the street. I want to see her find permanent housing. I want, to f I want her to have a relationship with her daughter. If the implication here tonight is that if you vote no on this tax, you don't support homeless services, you don't support our police officers, you don't support our firefighters, I flat out reject that. And so do many of the 13,000 people that signed this petition. We simply disagree with this particular tax increase, this particular approach. It's complicated, it costs too much, and there has to be a better way. Uh, thanks for being here this evening, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Preston. Thank you, Virginia. So now we're going to dig in a little deeper with questions. So we're going to start with questions from the crew at the Salem Reporter. I want to remind you that if you have questions in the audience, fill out a card or raise your hand and we'll get one of the McKay uh, runners to get a card to you so that we can consider your questions as well this evening because your questions are frankly the most important. So we'll start with our Salem Reporter staff and um, asking Virginia and Preston to be mindful of time and uh, not to make another speech, <laughs> but to answer the question. So we'll start with Rachel. All right. Um, most of these questions are for one or the other of you. I think we have one that's for both of you, so we're just going to kind of alternate. Um, so my first question is for Virginia. The city has said that without more money, you're going to have to cut the number of police officers and firefighters we now have. How much more dangerous do you think Salem will become if this tax is not passed? Well, I think that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, I do not have a crystal ball. Um, and I don't, I want to be realistic, but I also don't want to just sit here and stoke fear. I would be very concerned um, by future cuts. Right now, we are unable to uh, reply to and answer the call for a lot of people. Uh, Y'all probably don't realize this, but we no longer have an officer who does um, investigations for auto theft. So that's not something that we offer our residents anymore. Um, so there are trends that we are having more violent issues, especially in our downtown area and Northeast Salem. Um, I am very concerned about that. I am very concerned about um, getting rid of our, um, or kind of disbanding our um, drug team, enforcement team, especially with fentanyl the way that it is right now in our community. So those are a couple of areas that I'm very concerned about and wanting to prevent with any further cuts. Does that answer the question for you? Preston, you want to address that issue? Absolutely. Uh, I mentioned I've got two younger siblings, uh, five years old and I believe 12 months or 13 months old now, as well as a two-year-old daughter. Community safety is something that's on my mind. Uh, frankly, it continues to pop up in public opinion polling as something that's on everybody's mind. But I, I guess I reject the premise of the question. I, this is not an either or discussion. We do not have to accept rising crime rates just because we j reject attacks. There are other options for raising revenue. There are other options for balancing the budget. Uh, and I, I think it's foolish to suggest that passing this tax increase is going to solve the very real community safety issues we're facing. You have other issues that are playing a huge role in that, Measure 110, you name it. Those are much broader conversations. I don't think this tax is necessarily going to solve that problem. Abby? All right, well, my next question is for Preston, so I'm going to flip that back to you. So there's other options for raising revenue, other options for balancing the budget. What options there would you support? 
I had a feeling you might ask me that question. Uh, <laughs> I'm personally the biggest fan of, of levees. I know Councillor Stapleton there are, suggested that there are some challenges uh, with levees and I'm sensitive to that. But I think the key, the key piece for me about levees is they have to be reauthorized by voters. And what the city council is asking for is more of your money. And I think a key element of that conversation is trust with the community. What I've sensed in this process is there maybe isn't enough trust to pass this particular tax increase. I think the option of a levy requires the city to go to voters, make a case for why they need this additional revenue, and assuming they do a good job with it, and I, I think all of us would hope that they do, and oftentimes they do, uh, that'll come up within five years, and we'll have an opportunity to reauthorize that levy. That's not a foreign concept in this community. Uh, bonds are you know, a different animal, but it's been mentioned several times tonight that this community did just pass a $300 million bond. What that says to me is that when the city makes the case and when other local organizations, such as the Salem Chamber, say yes to this, the community buys in. And from my perspective, that simply hasn't happened in this conversation. Uh, this question is for Virginia. Uh, if this tax passes, why should a new business open in Salem rather than Kaiser or just outside city limits? Thank you. You know, I think that the Salem business community is a really unique and uh, special thing that we have here. And I think that it has been continually growing over the years, even with the challenges like our downtown space over the few years that I've been a city councilor. Um, I have worked hard on cultivating relationships with those business owners, and I feel that I do have their trust in addressing some of their concerns. I think that even though Preston does not feel confident in my answers, that the rulemaking process is going to solve a lot of the questions that folks have. I have full confidence in the process. It is a democratic process. It's open to the public. and. As we work with local business owners, um, hopefully with the chamber um, and with other nonprofits and residents here in Salem, we can come to um, a better understanding of what this tax is going to look like and how it is going to be implemented and the impacts on local businesses. Um, I think that once those issues have been resolved, I think that uh, folks will come to understand that it is not going to be uh, something that drives business out of the city. Preston, you want to take a shot at that? Look, I think businesses across this community are, are facing many of the same price challenges that a lot of families are, and this would be another tax. You heard from, I think it was nearly 100 people who came to the city council chambers on July 10th. Uh, some of them outright opposed the tax, some of them said they at least wanted to have an opportunity to vote on it, but many of those people were business people. I've heard from many of them since who opposed this tax, who, and you know, this is no fault of the city, but who are worried about some of the state mandates that are coming down that cost them money just the same. The fact is many of our businesses in this community are facing crushing costs and this would add, add to it, at least from an administrative perspective. But uh, some of them are also having a very difficult time finding employees and that this tax is going to add to that challenge as well. All right, uh, this question is for Preston. Uh, where do you think the city can make cuts? Yeah, again, I, I reject the premise of the question. This is not a, an either or situation. This tax was not going to take effect until next July. If the situation is as dire as the city council suggests, as the city manager suggests, uh, several members of the city council who voted in favor of this tax have suggested that they believe this tax is now going to fail at the ballot. If the situation is that dire, if the tax is going to fail, why aren't we having a conversation now about how to bridge that gap before those cuts come? I believe we still have time to have that conversation. Virginia? Uh, where would you like the city to make cuts, or where can it make cuts? Yeah. You know, I think that it's, it's really interesting to hear Preston talk about this kind of false either or. Um, and I think that the city council has been clear and transparent about this since we started talking about this. 
We have been making cuts all along and trying to spare the impacts to our residents as much as possible. Um, when we are looking ahead, we have to plan for future, um, future councils and future budgets. And so in order to do that, um, knowing that trying to find a revenue option that is going to work for everybody uh, perfectly, which I don't think there is a perfect answer, is going to take a lot of time. And so we are going to need to make tax cuts, or sorry, we are gonna have to cut services um, in the near future, like I mentioned in my comments. Those are going to come in the next calendar year so that we can spread out and spare the most painful cuts until hopefully we can find another revenue option if this measure fails. So people will start to feel it um, if the measure fails, and that is good governance. That is us taking our jobs as city councilors very seriously and making sure that we are protecting the core services of the city as much as we possibly can, and by making cuts to things like parks and libraries in the short term, we are extending how long we can pay for critical, more critical services like police and fire. So I hope that answers the question. Rachel? Mm -hmm. This is for Virginia. Salem currently has, as of this morning, 23 empty police officer jobs, and departments around the country are struggling to hire officers and competing with each other for them. Why should Salem give the police department more money when you can't have the people for the budget the department already has? Thank you for the question. Um, this has been uh, more of a cyclical thing. I've learned a lot about this in the years since I've become a city council. counselor. Um, there are historically times when it is harder to hire for public service uh, positions, and the police officers have been, uh, the police department has been having that challenge over the last few years. As you can think back over the past three years, it has been a really challenging time for police officers across the country. So that does not, you know, wave a good, you know, welcome flag. Everybody should join us over here. It's so much fun to go to protests all the time. Um, so, with that said, there was a decline in interest in the job. So, as we are looking forward, that trend is starting to change. And we are starting to see more people take an interest in really this wonderful public service job that is available here in the city of Salem. We are also running into another issue, which is we have a lot of people who are retiring. So, we hired more people last year than we have in the past, I think, five years, if I have my dates right. We had more hires in, but we also had more people retire. So, we, it is a constant trying to fill um, this void um, that is occurring because of retirements. Now, we are projecting that those retirements are going to taper off. People who are not eligible for retirement are kind of coming to an end. Um, and we're going to see more retention for longer here as we move into the next couple of years. And so we do project to have those positions filled as much as possible, and it is needed in our community. Our police officers are stretched extremely thin at the moment, and so um, keeping those positions uh, funded is really important so that we can get our police level staffing up to the measure that, or the level that is really gonna be beneficial to the residents of Salem. Virginia, let me let me ask you a follow-up question, if I may. I, I, the, the question occurs, well, why not fill the positions you've already funded and see what the impact is before you start layering on more positions? So right now, we are hoping to do that. We're hoping to fill those 22 positions. Um, as you see, some of the cuts we have coming impact the police department. Um, we're reducing that by five. And so we're going to continue to try and uh, kind of walk that fine balance between taking away some positions and also working hard to fill the positions that we have to meet the needs of the community. We also are looking at um, trying to shift the way that we do policing. It has been a really a loud cry from our community that they want to shift to more community policing which we've started to do um, with the SOS team, which if you're not familiar with that, it's two police officers and four public works um, 
people who create a team that go out and interact with our unsheltered um, neighbors who are living in unmanaged camps. And it really is a fantastic example of community policing. And that is what our community is demanding that we do. Um, they're demanding that we shift to that. And so in order to maintain what we have currently, to respond to those emergency calls right away every day, and then also make the shift to a more community policing uh, kind of outlook, we're gonna need to uh, kind of bridge that gap as we're making that progression to that new form of policing. Okay, Preston. it's important to, to point out, we're talking about 17 vacant positions in our police department and cutting five positions. And I, I don't want to paint in broad strokes for the entire city budget because I'm sensitive anytime we're talking about cutting jobs, um, that there are real people and involved. In, but in this particular case, and in a lot of cases across the city, there are vacancies that have been open for a very long time. We're talking about cutting those vacancies and hopefully in a, in a very short term way. But the, in a lot of cases, these are not necessarily people who are being laid off. And I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind as we have this conversation. Virginia insists on answering, too. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, there is a lot of conversation about just getting rid of vacancies. Just get rid of the vacancies. But my pushback on this is that just because it is a vacancy does not mean that it is not a needed position. We need those officers, we need those firefighters, and in order to do that, we need to budget and hire for them. Okay, thank you. All right, for Preston. <laughs> Salem business owners regularly raise concerns and complaints about people camping on or near their property. If the city closes almost 300 shelter beds and disbands its homeless outreach team, which is what they said they'll do with this tax does not pass, like I mentioned several times, I have family members that are deeply impacted by the crisis in our streets, and that's something that's really personal for me. I think it's probably personal for a lot of people in this room. But I mentioned earlier our, our governor who said she's likely to vote no on this tax. You would be hard-pressed to find somebody in this state who cares more about the people living on our streets and finding them permanent housing finding them a, an appropriate social safety position than Governor Kotek. And when you've got a, an ally as powerful as that and somebody who's acknowledging that yes, the city council has a legitimate concern with the state not paying its fair share, I think we need to push that conversation. The governor is relatively new in her position as governor. Certainly she, had, uh, she was the speaker of the house for a while, but as governor, she's got some different purse strings to pull on. Let's have a conversation with the governor about trying to fix this crisis. I don't think she wants to see the city of Salem take a step back when it comes to serving our homeless population either. Virginia? Thank you. Um, this is a really interesting aspect to the conversation around this and how we move forward as a community. I think I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Carefully, but soon. <laughs> <laughs> when you're a city councilor, you learn the weight of your words and you learn to monitor them very closely. <laughs> um, I really appreciate Governor Tina Kotek and her time at the state capitol. I also get really frustrated by this conversation because we have been asking for payment in lieu of taxes for a long time. The League of Oregon Cities has been pushing the issues with Measure 5 and 50 for over 20 years, and we have not had any action at the state level. So when people say we need to start having conversations, I want to push back hard on that. These conversations have been ongoing for years, for decades, and we have not gotten a response. So. Yes, this is hard, but I also think that by the Salem City Council passing this, we have brought this attention to this issue more than anything else that we have done in the past 20 plus years as cities across Oregon. So I look forward to hearing what the governor wants to do to help alleviate the strain here in the city of Salem. 
And yes, payment in lieu of taxes would be amazing, and your mayor, when he was serving as a state representative, pushed hard for that, and it failed. So I want us to go in with clear eyes on this issue and realize that yes, we can talk about it and we will continue to talk about it. We have not had any help in over 20 years. Question. Despite my bald head, I'm not quite as old as I look. I was born in 1991, which means this conversation to Councillor Stapleton's point has been going on longer than I've been alive. Uh, but my point is, we've got a new governor, we've got a new speaker of the house, we're soon to have a new speaker of the house as the current speaker of the house is uh, running for attorney general. We have a fairly new Senate president. Uh, we have a bipartisan delegation of state legislators in this community, many of whom are new in their positions. Uh, I, I appreciate Mayor Hoy's efforts as a former state representative. I, I can imagine that was a difficult conversation. Yes, this conversation has been going on for a long time, but I think there is opportunity in the fact that there's been so much change at the state level. Thank you. And this is a question for both of you. We'll start with Virginia. Uh, what's one statement about this tax that the opposing side gets wrong? <laughs> I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Lordy. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> one statement that you all get wrong. I think I get frustrated by the conversation that this isn't an either or, or that by somehow because the city council or the committee to save Salem has phrased it in a way of either or, um, that there aren't real consequences to this vote. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot from folks that we just need to get around the table and have another discussion. And I get really frustrated. Because like I said, we've been talking about this for 20 plus years. I actually was calling people to see about hosting yard signs and a woman said, I support you 100%. I was a city councilor 25 years ago and we were talking about the payroll tax. So let that sink in. <laughs> so it is, there are consequences to your vote in November. Is it the end of the world? No, of course not. We will continue on, we will take the cuts that we need to take, and we will continue to have conversations around the table. And I hope OBI is there for those conversations. Um, but I, I really get frustrated when it feels like they're saying that we are painting this as an either or because we are talking about cuts. The cuts are simply a reality for me. I am not trying to be a fear monger or stoke fear among people. I am simply here to do good governance and do what needs to be done and I'm ready to do those things. But now the question has been posed to you all and you are in the seat of the city council and the budget committee and you get to make that decision. And I look forward to hearing what that is on November 7th. Question? Yeah, I'm not gonna say anything negative about Councilor Stapleton and her team, I, I you know, I think Councilor Stapleton has a thankless job. It's an unpaid job. Um, you know, many of those city council meetings stretch on for hours. I, I do sincerely thank you for your service, for your fellow city council members, and certainly the budget committee members and the many other committees that are a part of um, the city budget. For me, this, um, you know, I, I'm not gonna challenge any of the statements you've made. It just comes down to a difference in priorities for me. And right now I'm focused on uh, residents of this community that are facing extraordinarily high housing costs, extraordinarily high inflation, and the businesses that are struggling under a crushing regulatory and tax environment. or employees to track how often they're working within Salem city limits. So what would you say to businesses that are concerned about the work that's required to comply with that? Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, a lot of times it's the pizza delivery. You bring up, bring up the pizza delivery guy, person. Um, and to that, you know, um, 
of course, we're going to work all of that out in rulemaking, but um, there are simple things that uh, people are talking about, like, well, I think we could easily put a minimum on this, right? So we have to work for a minimum of eight hours in the city of Salem in order to, to not activate that tax. There's lots of different ways to simplify this and make it easy um, or easier. Nothing that's new is easy, I will admit that. Um, but I think that there are a lot of questions and implementing it through that open, transparent process with the stakeholders at the table is gonna be really key and important um, as we move forward. So I have full faith in the process and I think that it will work itself out in the end. Preston? Uh, yeah, to the business owners that are concerned about the implementation phase of this, I, I hear that. My short answer to you is vote no. Okay. All right, so we're going to start uh, start hitting you with questions from the audience. A reminder to you out there that if you have questions still, just raise your hand, or if you have your question written, or we'll get a card to you. So let's dive in. What's the audience want to know about? I want to say one thing too. We've got a number of questions here that are factual just about how the tax would work and a number of these are things we've answered in our reporting and we're going to be looking at these in the coming days and getting that information out there so we will be using this to inform our coverage. So if we don't get to your question tonight, we will do our best to answer it in the follow-up reporting as well. Um, all right. If the tax fails, what are the options other than cuts? What other options are possible? Is this to me? Sorry. Most people did not address these. Most okay. of them are about how the tax would work, so I think a large share of them are going to be for you. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, that's fine. Um, that's why I get paid the big bucks. Volunteer. Um, so could you uh, say that one more time? If the tax fails, what are the options other than cuts? What other options are possible? Well, like I mentioned, there will be cuts because we need to prolong this. Um, if you can kind of imagine, we're trying to do a soft landing. So if we don't do any cuts while we're trying to figure out what kind of revenue option uh, that we're going to do uh, in the end, then if we don't come up with a revenue option uh, by a certain time, we're going to have to make some really hard and devastating cuts right away. So we are trying to do a soft landing here and, again, protect those critical services as long as possible uh, for the city. So um, other revenue options, of course, I think there was eight that were given to the uh, budget committee. I don't remember them off the top of my head because, honestly, my entire focus is on the payroll tax and trying to get it across the finish line. Um, city councilors are talking to me. I am talking to them about ideas, um, none of which are ready for prime time. Um, but as somebody said, you have to have a plan uh, A, B, C, and D, and I, I think I'm on F. I think uh, all of us take our job very, very seriously. Um, we have, um, a lot of us have really good relationships together, and we are uh, putting our heads together and trying to figure out what comes next if this fails. So. Um, that will all come out when we know what happens in November. You know, right now we're kind of focused on what are the cuts going to look like because we're going to need to adopt that supplemental budget right away. Um, and then we're going to reinstate that revenue task force. We're going to have a whole new conversation with hopefully folks from um, all over the community putting in their buy-in and, and what is going to work for them um, when we're talking about another revenue option. Preston? Yeah, at least at the, the document that I reviewed earlier today, there were 11 options that the budget committee came up with. Uh, the payroll tax was just one of those. I'm not going to sit here and speak on behalf of the people that signed the petition or certainly other residents of this community and suggest which one of those is best. I'll just say that there certainly are other options out there. I think there are options available that go beyond the 11 that were identified by the budget committee. I've uh, hammered on the governor and the legislature a number of times this evening, and I'm going to continue to beat that drum. The state is flush with cash. And I'm sure that is frustrating as we have this conversation here tonight, but the state is sitting on record revenues and owns property that they are not paying their fair share for in this community. That's a situation that needs to be remedied. Awesome. So this one's a two-parter audience question. 
So Eugene already implemented a payroll tax and still have a deficit. How will this payroll tax be sufficient? And then part two, maybe a sales tax for anyone who purchases goods in Salem, even tourists enjoying our city. Preston, you take that one, start. <laughs> Um, yes, the as Preston alluded to earlier, the Eugene payroll tax is very different from the Salem payroll tax. I mean, they're basically in the same kind of uh, type of tax, but there are very distinct differences. Um, the tax rate that they have is much lower. Um, I learned this with uh, Preston when we were at our last debate. We know each other. We're getting to know each other quite well, actually. Um, and we learned that they uh, kind of baked in the rate to their charter. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, the charter can only be changed by a vote of the people. And so uh, they did that in order to help get uh, folks kind of uh, more rally people around the cause. Um, we, uh, when we talk about that um, as a council now, it was not something that was proposed to us when we were considering this. Um, but I think it's really important that I cannot make decisions based on a single person or a single neighborhood or a single ward. I'm making decisions based on the city as a whole and the needs of the city across the board. I am also not tied in to any one period of time. So I am making decisions that are based on past council's actions that I had nothing to do with. I am dealing with that. And I also need to be considerate about not tying the hands of a future council and making things so much more difficult for them as well. So I have to look at this from extremely broad area and a very high level. Um, I don't have the privilege that most people have on whether or not um, this is going to work for their family or their neighborhood um, or their household. Um, I have to think about things at a different level. So um, I hope that answers the question. I'm not going to comment on a sales tax. <laughs> Yeah, I think every local government is different, uh, but every local government is impacted by measures 5 and 50 as well as other pressures. There are conversations in communities all across the state about how to deal with deficits as they come up. Eugene is just one of those. But I think the facts in Eugene are, are very different than the situation we're facing here in Salem. One, they already do have a payroll tax in place. There's a cap on that payroll tax, as I mentioned previously. Um, but Eugene also has other unique features as part of their budget. They have a local gas tax, which is an option for any community in this state. Uh, but here tonight, we're talking about the Salem payroll tax that's going to be on the ballot. And from my perspective, uh, it's not a tax that is acceptable for this community. One of the things that concerns me most since you brought up Eugene is that there is no cap in place on this tax. Uh, I think that's something that con should concern everybody. One's for Preston. I'm trying. Um, this is a clarification on the gene, or sorry, on the sale tax. Is it the rate, the cap, the less than 1% amount? How would it increase? Sorry, could you say that again? Isn't the rate of the tax the cap? You're talking about how Eugene has a cap on the payroll tax, Salem doesn't. So isn't the tax rate the cap? How would it increase? Yeah, you're testing my knowledge of the Eugene Charter and local government rules a little bit. But I think the important point in Eugene is that they, they sent that change to the voters as sort of a gesture of goodwill and trust between the city council and that community. Uh, that did not happen in this particular case, but for a petition that put it on the ballot. Um, there is no cap even with this referendum campaign. There's nothing stopping the city council today from having that same conversation and putting their own cap in place. I think that would be a gesture of goodwill towards this community. And Brett, I'm trying to refer the questioner's intent here. By a cap, do you mean a cap on the rate or a cap on the total amount collected? Or both? A cap on the rate. Okay. Uh, this is another question, obviously. Uh, Oregonians have felt the frustration of businesses not being able to fill positions. With minimum wage workers exempt, are there concerns that workers will not take professional development and growth opportunities and or promotions in order to avoid paying this tax? Will this harm the long-term workforce in Salem? 
I'm guessing that goes to me. You know, I think um, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think that um, I was really amazed. I was down at the closure for Salem Summit, which I'm still kind of brokenhearted about you two. I am. Yeah. Wonderful store. And I was talking with the owner about why this was happening. And uh, I was expecting to hear, you know, all kinds of things from REI to um, some of the challenges we've had over the last few years in our downtown. Um, and he responded with, I can't find anybody to work. And I was floored. I was completely floored. How, one, I totally would have worked there. You know, I wanted, but I couldn't tell him now, right? I was at the last day of his business. So at any rate, I missed out on a great job, I'm sure. Um, but it really hit home for me, just the different challenges that, that folks that are owning businesses in the city of Salem are facing. And just how, this is what I'm always struck with, just how do I help with that? How do I work with county, with the school system, with the state to try and address this issue. So it is an issue. Um, I, like I mentioned before about this, I am hopeful that through the process um, of uh, getting to where we're gonna get to implementation, um, that those questions are answered and we can find ways to address the different issues that uh, different business owners have. Yeah, I think the question sort of raises another point that I haven't talked about tonight that I think is uh, sort of unfortunate about the tax, which I, I believe it was a sincere effort to protect minimum wage workers, and I, I can appreciate that. But, I, you know, I also think back to my high school days when I was a pizza delivery driver in this town, and I got a 10-cent raise over minimum wage. Well, under this tax, it, it would cost me less to just stay at minimum wage. I, I think that's fundamentally unfair and uh, maybe a consequence of this tax that wasn't fully vetted. Also for Councilor Stapleton. The tax burden falls on employees, whereas Eugene's payroll tax is partially quoted by the employers. Was there any discussion at the city about asking employers, especially the state of Oregon, to take on some of the burden if it was deemed unfeasible? Why? I'm so excited you all asked that question because I was hoping you would. Um, thank you so much. Um, I was talking with Bill Smaldone, I think is how you pronounce his last name, and he was a city councilor back, I think, in 2002 when they passed um, a business tax. Because, of course, we were still faced with the issues that we have right now. So they tried to take action, and what happened was that the Chamber of Commerce got involved and they ran people against every, pretty much every single person that was up for election the following year. And they got every single person voted out, and the first thing that they did was repeal the business tax. So, the other point of this is that as the city of Salem, we cannot tax the state of Oregon. It doesn't work. We cannot tax the county, we cannot tax the state, and we cannot tax the federal government. So when we are looking at $7.25 million, right, um, in revenue every year from, from the property that the state owns, um, we cannot, there's a reason why we're not getting that money. We cannot tax them that because we are the lesser form of government. So when we look at an employer tax, that would fall under that same rule that we are not allowed to tax the state of Oregon as an entity. Yeah, at Oregon Business and Industry, I uh, have the fortunate opportunity to represent dozens, in fact, hundreds of members who own businesses in this community. Uh, I'm certainly not going to speak for all of them with one voice. Uh, I'm certainly not going to speak on behalf of the Salem Chamber. Um, but I do see Mr. Hoffert here tonight. What I do know from talking with a lot of business owners in this community is they are concerned about the city budget. They are concerned about adequate funding for police and fire. They are willing participants in that conversation. 
but the tax before us right now is a payroll tax paid by their employees, not even employers, and many of them are not comfortable with that. And for me, this conversation continues to go back to trust. This community has shown time and again when there's an honest conversation between the council and businesses and residents of this community, the community is willing to support new revenue increases, whether it's the $300 million bond that was passed just this past November or other options. So, you know, I found the business leaders in this community very willing to engage in this conversation, and I have no reason to believe they wouldn't engage moving forward. Virginia? the business community continues to be involved in this conversation and the chamber as well. Uh, they had members on the previous revenue task force. Um, they were well represented there and I hope that they continue to be represented um, there as well. I will say that I think one of the key reasons that our last bond measure passed was that it was because there was no increase in your taxes. So that being said, I want to be real about why I think that passed. It was a really a historic uh, opportunity that we had because other bonds were coming off the rolls that we could then take out more bonds for projects without increasing the tax rate. And that was really a key in when we were talking to folks on why they were supporting that measure. So I understand that the, and I'm honored that folks really um, trusted us and were wanting to invest in our community with that $300 million bond. Um, but I also understand that one of the main reasons was because it wasn't going to increase their tax rate. Um, and through that process, we had many conversations, uh, transparent and open, that the bond can pay for things, it cannot pay for people. The general fund is 80% of it is people. So in order to staff those new fire stations, we need to hire more people. And in order to do that, we need to have a conversation about revenue. And that was clear and always present in the conversations we had throughout that process. So there is a lot of nuance with this. And I want to, um, I want to say that I really do sincerely hope that we continue to have conversations with the business community. Awesome. And I'm hoping to separate questions to bother Josh Eggleston, our city financial officer with, uh, but a couple people have asked this, so if we can clear it up, I think that could help. Uh, people are asking how many employees the city will have to hire to manage this payroll tax and uh, what they would do. And if you don't know, I understand. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. One sounds right. Um, yeah. I believe it's four. There were two added. Um, this is another audience question. Uh, if we are taxing the working poor, how does that help the houseless problem? Or, uh, yeah, Preston, if you want to go for it. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> It's a challenging balance to have when you are governing and you are trying to continue to support city services that people rely on and count on and balance the very challenging ideas of how the Oregon tax code is set up and trying to thread that needle is extremely difficult. I'm not saying that it is easy or that it was a decision that we came to lightheartedly. We understand that there are consequences for every action, every word that comes out of our mouth, there are consequences for it. We also understand that we have to provide good governance in order to sustain city services that people rely on. And that means we have to have a tough conversation about revenue. And so when we're talking about taxing people, like was mentioned, we tried to, to find ways to protect the most vulnerable in our community. Sadly, that means you have to draw a line in the sand. And like Preston was saying, automatically you're gonna run into that, well, what about a quarter or a 10 cent raise that pushes somebody above that and now they're paying the tax. Every time that you try to protect a certain person or group of people within our community, that means that you're drawing that line in the sand and there are consequences for that. So although it could be said very you know, flippantly as if we were maybe not smart enough to figure that out, we were. 
we knew what we were doing, and we tried our best to make sure that the people who are most vulnerable in our community had as much protection as possible from this. There are other things that we are doing to try to help alleviate that by making it easier for them to get financial support in other areas of city bills, like your utilities or your garbage bill. Those things are things that we're working on to help folks who are classified as working poor. I also wanna say that if this does fail and we do make cuts, then the poorest of our community members, those who are unsheltered, will be greatly impacted as well, and that needs to be something that we need to consider as well as a community. Great, I love these questions. Thank you for asking. So when you think about a city, a lot of folks think about those main things, the characteristics that make a city a city, police, fire, parks, library, senior services, like our Center 50 Plus. All of those things reside in the general fund. And as I'm sure you know, because you are all up to snuff on our city budget, the city budget has a lot of different buckets that cannot cross, they cannot co-mingle together. So I cannot take money from our utility fund to pay for police officers. That is not something we can do legally. So our general fund pays for all of those things that I just listed, right? The things that you think about, the library, parks, police and fire, etc. So when we are looking at increasing revenue in the general fund to support things like police, fire, EMS, and our unhoused programs, which are outside of our general fund, um, those things alleviate the strain on the general fund as a whole. And so that's why you see if we don't do this, we're gonna make cuts to our library and our parks and our Center 50 Plus, et cetera. So a lot of people feel that the core of government is to protect its people. That would be police and fire and EMS services. So when you look at that, you wanna protect those as much as possible. And the other things within the general fund are the things that are going to take the hit. So when, I think the Committee to Save Salem does a good job of balancing all of those things because we also understand that there is going to be impacts to police and fire. We cannot protect them 100% with the cuts. But we also know that there are a lot of people who value and use all of the city services that we provide in the general fund. The library is a very special place for a lot of people. Our parks are something that are used by so many um, to access green space throughout the community. So. When we are looking at the general fund, the, the payroll tax will go to fund emergency services within the general fund, but it also helps to stabilize that general fund and allow for us to continue to make investments in uh, keeping our library open um, and continuing to maintain the parks that we do have. I hope that makes sense. Preston, do you want to take a run with that? Yeah, I mean, the tax is marketed as a, a tax to fund public safety, but you just heard it from Councillor Stapleton, it really is just an input into the general fund. And from my perspective, it's an input that's uh, a blank check due to the fact that there's no cap on it. It can be raised at any time. And it comes at a time when the trust with the community just doesn't really feel like it's there. And you know, I, I can't speak to the rhetoric that Save Salem is using, but for myself personally, it is a little bit confusing to hear the tax marketed as something that's gonna fund our police officers and firefighters and then hear about cuts to splash pads. Okay, Virginia, Preston, you're at the finish line. One last question. One question, it's for Virginia, and it's, uh, I believe, referring to the ref referendum. Uh, quote, it sounds like the payroll tax was the easy way out, not requiring a vote in the first place. Why didn't you trust your citizens to hear the case made and vote for what they want slash need and pay for it? Again, I'm so thankful for these questions because this was one I was hoping would be asked of me as well tonight, so thank you. I think it's really interesting uh, to be a city councilor. <laughs> 
Um, I think it was really, really interesting to be put in this position. And for me, so many people um, really felt that I didn't trust the voter. And I think what I really want to communicate is that I didn't trust my ability to access the resources I needed in order to educate every voter here, to help them understand what was at stake, and to get them to the place where they would be willing to vote for something that they had never experienced or understood. So the goal that we came together, our coalition that voted uh, to have this implemented by the council, we really were focused on going to the voters at a later date. And I think that's something that gets lost. There was a sunset date. Um, it was for seven years. It takes two years to implement the tax. And so um, they wanted to give some uh, time there for the, us to get it implemented, but then also for us to hire the people that we needed to hire and start to see the impacts, the positive impacts of the much needed revenue for our community. So at any point in time, we could go to the voters during that seven year period. And what I was hoping to do was sustain the services without making cuts and continue to invest in the community. We have a lot of momentum in the city of Salem right now and I wanna continue that momentum a lot of times in a big situation like this, when you hit the pause button and everything falls back or you lose ground, it takes so much more energy and time and money to get us back going with the momentum that we were going with before. So I wanted to recognize the hard work of our city staff and that they were to the point of, of really strain and um, Really, some of them were collapsing with what was being put on them. I wanted to honor that, and I wanted them uh, to recognize that I wanted to keep the momentum going as much as we could. I wanted to use the time for um, rulemaking and education as much as I could to go out and advocate for why this was important and to help folks understand why it was needed. Um, as you heard Les comment earlier, the city of Salem can't be here it's not because they don't want to be, it's that they legally cannot help me with this. Okay, they cannot legally be here to advocate for this tax. So, if we would have gone the route that council had in mind, we would have used that year, year and a half to two years as an education process for the community, an engagement process with the community, that the city of Salem staff could help us reach people and we could have the community come into the conversation we would then be able to prove to them that we did need this money and that the money would be spent the way that we said it would be spent and that uh, in the end they would vote to continue the tax and I would have earned that vote and that trust in that process. Now we are uh, to a place where it has been referred to voters. Um, it's extremely expensive. <laughs> Uh, for us to go right now, I was hoping to go during a, a primary election um, or a, a midterm. Um, it's much cheaper to go to the voters at that point in time. Um, this one is costing us about a quarter of a million dollars. It's just me and a couple other counselors and the Committee to Save Salem out here trying to educate and get folks to go for a yes vote on this and, and really learn and engage with the city in that way. And I don't know if you feel up to that task. It is very daunting. It's daunting to be here and be me and know that I had you know a few months in order to get all of this information conveyed. Things like measures five and 50 and compression, all of those really interesting things um, that make Oregon tax code so hard on local cities. So, I'm trying the best I can, and um, my original goal, my plan A, uh, was, was referred to the voters, and so plan B is to hopefully get that across the finish line, and if that doesn't work, I'll move on to plan C. I'm obviously not a member of the city council, so I can't speak to why they decided not to refer it to voters, but I. 
I do remember that evening very clearly. I remember hearing from business owners in this community, from residents of this community, who spoke over and over and over again with one voice to say, let Salem vote. And that's exactly what we're gonna do this November. We're gonna decide the fate of this tax increase. I think that's a really healthy conversation for this community to have. And it's not just me, it's the 13,000 people that signed this petition. Uh, I'm looking forward to how things turn out on November 7th. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've been very fortunate this evening to have two individuals who are deeply passionate about the community that you call home, who put themselves before you. They had no knowledge of any of our questions. They came here unprepared in that sense, and uh, they are commended for their diligence and thoughtfulness in addressing those questions forthrightly. And I hope that you all join me in thanking them for being here this evening. Preston and Virginia. I think so. Let's see. Somebody will come out of nowhere with a last name. And I want to thank Rachel and Abby for their work tonight in managing these questions and preparing them. But frankly, the biggest thanks of all goes to each one of you for taking the time out of your day, out of your evening, to come and listen to these folks, to absorb the information, to pose the questions that you've asked. I hope that when you go home, that you talk about these issues with your family, with your friends, with your business associates. Uh, as Virginia said earlier, no matter what your position is on this, be engaged. This is our community. With that, I bid you a good night. Hi, we're at the Elsinore Theater where the Salem Reporter Town Hall just wrapped up. My name's Abby McDonald. I'm a reporter with Salem Reporter, and this is Rachel Alexander, who's our managing editor. We just heard from uh, Councilor Virginia Stapleton, who is leading the Save Salem campaign in favor of the payroll tax, and Preston Mann, who is a member of the Oregon Business and Industries Group, uh, which led the referendum against the campaign against the payroll tax to put it on the ballot. Uh, Councilor Virginia Stapleton's position uh, was that the tax is needed to maintain city services and to keep emergency response timely. Uh, she also addressed a question about uh, why it wasn't referred to voters in the first place, and she said that 
she thought it was best for the city to move on with the payroll tax, move forward, and uh, really just try to educate people afterward. Um, so I thought it was a great discussion between the both of them and a really supportive audience on both sides. And for the No campaign, uh, Preston with Oregon Business and Industry emphasized the tax structure, some of the complexities around administering it. One of the sticking points for business groups has been that the tax would apply to employees for work done within city limits, which has potential to create a lot of administrative challenges for workers who are maybe moving between job sites, doing delivery, that sort of thing. Um, there was also quite a lot of discussion on both sides and from the audience just about other options for revenue out there, local levies, getting help from the state, things that the council has discussed for years and that um, will be ongoing as the city tries to figure this out, as well as talk about what the city council will choose to cut um, some police and fire positions, library hours, parks maintenance, if this tax fails in November. So a lot of um, weighty issues for citizens in Salem to consider, and we will keep bringing you coverage of that at SalemReporter.com as these discussions unfold. You did much better than I would. Oh, you're fine.